the act of aging is forgetting who you're supposed to be. And so that's what cancer is. That's what um, aging is. And so what are the precipitating factors that make a cell forget who it is? And so using the reactive oxygen species analogy, um, anytime you distract the machinery that is necessary for remembering who you are, you age. Welcome to Longevity Advantage. I'm your host, Scott Fulton. We have a rare treat in store for you today. We're going to take you inside the genetics laboratories at University of Virginia Medical School and introduce you to Dr. John Gilday. Dr. Gilday is a 30-year scientist, assistant professor. He's an expert in molecular genetics and cell pathophysiology. He got his PhD at Johns Hopkins University and his postdoctorate at University of Virginia. He's published 55 peer-reviewed articles and he's editor at Biomedical Research International. His research contributions include the HIV virus, biological warfare, cancer, and preventive health biology. He specializes in transcriptional memory genetics, cancer metastatic progression, and hypertension. He's also going to share some insights into viruses and our immunity. Thanks for showing up today. I think you're in for a real treat. Enjoy. So, John, welcome. Uh, everyone's just got your introduction. Um, so you're at the University of Virginia today in the analytical core facility. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, there's um, uh, in the research world, there's all different levels of grants. And um, people probably know that there's very big grants that are in parts of clinical studies um, where you're, you're answering really big questions. This is in between what's called an R01. That's a single lab, ask, uh, ask an important question. Um, so the, the grant that I work for is called a program project grant. They're bigger than R01s, so it's actually four labs together to do one, one thing. And in this case, we have uh, a human clinical study. We have mouse models to mimic the disease status. And then we have cell culture models. And then I run the analytical core facility. And the analytical core facility is basically um, does the testing to support the other three uh, arms of the study. So um, I can pay attention to all the controls and, and uh, precision of testing and try to get it automated whenever I can as to automate the testing. So it's um, very reliable and I do a lot of blinding which is you know where you take your samples and and blind yourself to the to the results and then just um, analyze it afterwards after unscrambling it and just compare it to control so um, when you have someone that's just paying attention to those uh, details you can you can um, free the other people up to ask the the really good scientific questions. Yeah, and it, uh, again, having had a number of years in research and kind of knowing what the academic environment is, that's probably one of the big, big distinctions between just how you work in a facility like yours versus a someone's developing a product and they're already looking for the answer and they're just, or they're, in terms of, they're looking to support the answer that they've already had in their in their marketing minds. Um, yeah. And if it doesn't fit, then we need to change the test. Uh, that's <laughs> n not how it works in your world, I'm sure. Yeah, there's um, a lot of really interesting thought in, in that arena. Um, me coming from a model organism, we, we think that's the best science where you say, uh, I'm studying an animal, but no one really cares about the outcome. And you say, I'm going to do a genetic screen to find all the genes involved in a particular pathway. And then out of the 20,000 genes, you find um, these seven genes that are involved in the pathway. And then you do what's called saturation mutagenesis, where you keep doing it until you get the same answer 30 or 40 times. And then you pretty much know that those are all the genes involved in that process. And that's the genetic basis of 
model organism um, uh, science, and and then from there, then you do the you know the molecular biology, set up a model system, and test it similarly. So uh, we think that that's the highest level, and um, maybe the lowest level is what you were talking about, where you go out with an agenda and um, you have a bunch of money and backers, and you you can't say no. Right. 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 Um, so you mentioned there, um, and, and really your specialty is signal transduction pathways. I think I got that out without marbling it up too much. T tell us what that is in its ba most basic level and, and why it's important or core to what you do. Yeah, probably a good, good example of it is um, uh, in my postdoc, I did uh, cell motility. And it's where in, in cancer, um, we had the hypothesis that if uh, cell motility is important in cancer metastasis, if you can slow down the cells moving, you probably affect metastasis. And so what we did for that project is we just, we um, asked everyone that we knew that had a, a molecule that was either a constitutive active version of a gene or uh, dominant negative uh, version of all these different signal transduction pathways. Um, classic one is RAS. Um, RAS is involved in many cancers, and there's an activating version of that gene, RAS. And a lot of people don't know also there's a dominant negative version of that gene, RAS. And then we would transfect in all these, transfect in to mean put that gene into cancer cell model and then look at how it affects cell motility. So we would set up a test where we're measuring um, how fast the cells are moving. And, uh, and so signal transduction is basically how a cell senses its environment around it and communicates it to the genes that are in the nucleus uh, to do a particular function. Yeah, and it... Um if we kind of take it down to, I think one of the key elements for people that that generally most of us aren't um, knowledgeable around is is an understanding of just how much communication goes on in the body, like every millisecond in every cell it, throughout your body. In terms of this is not a point A to point B, right? Can you give us some context of just how active communications are in the human body? Yeah, so even, um, for instance, one of, the, one of the interesting pathways hopefully we'll talk about later is a, a, a gene called NRF2. Um, and then if you're, if you're interested in longevity and health span, things that uh, I know you and your, your followers talk a lot about, um, even this uh, NRF2 protein, when you study it on a second by second basis, um, it's making adjustments uh, every second. Um, so it's responding to its environment uh, moment by moment and changing from cytoplasm to the nucleus, turning on and turning off genes. Um, it's being degraded. Uh, so the complexity of just that one protein is, um, kind of hard to imagine. And then on top of that, there's um, in the range of 2000 G coupled protein receptors, which is kind of the initial molecule that initiates the signal transduction. So there's basically um, at least, you know, two to 3000 of these receptors. And then there's multiple ligands for each one of those receptors. Um, it's, it's an orchestra and it's uh, amazingly beautiful. And uh, being able to, to pull out one single um, string from, you know, from that orchestra is, is a person can study their whole life on that, plucking that one string. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, you referred to it earlier, um, and I know when, when we talked offline, um, you do work, obviously, your work supports cancer research, but uh, but you do work beyond that um, at a personal level. 
uh, can you talk us kind of what, what's the history of what what drew you down that path and uh, and maybe why partly why you and I connected so well when we started to have some conversations around longevity and health? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I probably uh, in the context of of timing, um, it's good to to put a little bit of context in into that just to to prime people to know where I was coming from. So um, after college, I, I worked for industry for four years where I developed tests and, you know, it's still what I do now. So um, very sensitive and very quick tests are my bread and butter. It's what I've always been interested in. And uh, a test or an assay is where you detect the amount of a molecule um, accurately and reproducibly. So after being in industry and doing that um, for a diagnostic lab in the first case, and in the second case for um, detecting ger germ warfare agents and, and developing a, um, an instrument to do that, um, I was very interested in how you, how you test things. But then I went off to uh, get my PhD and got interested in fruit flies. Um, and how to do basic research, um, uh, epigenetics in, in fruit fly research. And then after that, I did a postdoc in um, cancer metastasis. So um, I had a good run there, uh, only did a three year postdoc and uh, had a lot of pretty influential papers from, from that stint, uh, studying metastasis and um, I guess my my claim to fame in that area was um, the discovery of a molecule called RAL that's involved in, in cell invasion and metastasis. Another but, one. Sorry, what, what was that molecule? I just had a funny audio thing, and I'm in case it uh, recorded yeah, that way. RAL, R A L is downstream of RAS. Okay. So it's involved in invasion and cell motility and then and is involved in metastasis. And then the other one is uh, a gene called um, ROGEDI2. Um, and that's um, called a metastasis suppressor gene. So when you lose that gene, a cell becomes metastatic. So I was kind of in the top of my field, all that to say I was in the top of my field. I, I could do tests, I can you know put the, cells and animal models and watch metastasis and um, all that was just to set up this one little thing was that uh, right at the end of my postdoc there, my wife got um, breast cancer. And um, all the things that I was studying and learning could not influence um, that outcome. Basically, you know, you can't put genes into people yet. <laughs> And uh, that was my mode of intervention. Um, so uh, my wife gets this very aggressive form of, of breast cancer. Um, and then I was basically faced with that fact that I couldn't help her at all. And I was kind of, um, had two young kids, uh, one and three years old. And um, I'm pretty good in the lab, but I'm not that Great around the house, and um, I was seeing, uh, you know, I was kind of falling apart, and um, decided that I had to try to another intervention to try and influence metastasis, and it had to be practical, and that's how I got into the world of um, uh, natural substances, because those you can get off off the shelf. You can buy them and you can um, use them in people. And so I dug into the literature and found out everything I could about what influences cancer, um, determined the concentrations of those um, phytonutrients, um, what they need to be at the cellular level in order to affect the signal transduction that I knew was important. And uh, I guess through, through all of that, I, came up with a strategy that um, was kind of unique and and uh, she did very well. Um, she's never 
had any kind of recurrence um, in 18 years. And um, pretty soon after we did that, we, we wanted to share that information with other people. And probably every week we meet with someone new and sit down with them and help guide them through uh, their, their cancer journey. Yeah, it, um, it, 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 I think it's really important because, again, you and I come from science backgrounds, right? So we're naturally, um, we're naturally wanting to be somewhat invasive and manipulative because that's what our training teaches us to do because, you know, get, get right in there with a tool and make some physical change. So if you look at gene editing, it's, you know, you know, I know the crude example is you go with the tweezers <laughs> and start pulling things out the way I explained. Um, but as you start to realize, as you obviously did long before I did, there's other ways that you can start switching genes. Um, and then you start to realize uh, how much more power you have uh, and start to realize, well, what the knowledge that means we all have, and that's where I think we're going to go in the conversation today. So um, that, that's a, uh, it's great that, that you do that because it's a, and, and for you to be part of our discussion today to, to allow us into your world, uh, you know, that, that's usually a, a world few of us get a, a look into. So, so that, that's, 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 that's just beautiful that you do that and you have that to share. Um, the, the other area, um, and partly because of timing where we're at, but I also know it's your background, um, is in viruses. So depending on when you're watching this, um, we're in the midst of, uh, of COVID-19 here uh, today. But, um, you know, it, it begs the question, you know, what is a virus? Um, how do they actually work? Um, and, and just to help give people some comfort around kind of demystifying some of that, because this is your world for, for the last couple of decades. So maybe you can just kind of take us through the... Uh, now this is probably one you'll have to dumb it down a little bit because uh, mm. it'll quickly get too deep for us. But uh, but at least um, kind of what, what you would want, what you think everybody should know about what a what a virus is and uh, and how it operates. Yeah, um, I use viruses in the lab all the time, so um, I kind of have a skewed version of of what they are and how they work. But um, because we make viruses in the lab to do particular things. Um, to you know, infect a, a cell and deliver a gene into a into a cell. Um, but I think a really good way to look at um, uh, a virus is that you know it's non-living to start off with. It's just um, nucleic acid and, and protein can't that's live that's on that's its that's own. Right. So that that's a really clear one: a virus versus a bacteria. Key distinction is living versus or living versus non-living. Right. Yeah, so a virus is non-living. Um, it cannot sustain it itself without um, being in contact with a living. Right. So um, going out to kill so, a virus is really <laughs> you're yeah. going to try to kill something that doesn't exist. So, so there's a common uh, belief that people have that that hopefully we can help a few with that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hey. Yeah. So it's basically a you know conglomeration of proteins that surround um, nucleic acid or the uh, in the case of uh, COVID-19, is it's an RNA virus. So the RNA is inside. And then it docks on a cell. Um, so there's a lot sort of in that mix. Um, because when you make viruses yourself, you have to choose an envelope protein, basically. In, in the case of the coronavirus, it's the spike protein. That's the shape of the protein that interacts with the receptor on the outside of the cell. So in the case of uh, COVID-19, the, the uh, spike protein is what it is. And um, on the human cell, it's a gene called ACE2, um, which I actually study because it's part of um, a project that I've been working on for a long time. And so this ACE2 gene um, is expressed in the alveoli, uh, type two alveoli in the in the lung, and then it's also found in the kidney, uh, uh, small intestines, 
and the liver. And basically those are where a lot of the dysfunction is in COVID-19. Not sure people, that's common knowledge. I haven't seen that um, discussed is that um, everyone is talking about the lungs only. And uh, one of the things we always say in people that are very, very, very sick, um, especially like the, the type four uh, cancer patients is um, one organ system starts to fail. Um, it's bad, but it's not usually fatal. But when you have two organ systems failing, um, that's usually um, not the end, but you really precipitously get worse. And so um, this one actually makes uh, a number of organ systems weaker, and it's, it's probably why it's such a deadly virus, is that it, it weakens your intestines. It's one of the common uh, uh, ailments that happen is your small intestines uh, start dysfunctioning, um, so do your, your kidneys, and that, that combination is bad. Okay, thank you. So, so we're exposed to viruses every day um, through through just interaction with the world around us, right? Um, so most of these viruses come at us, and and our body deals with it. So, so kind of in the everyday, how how does the body deal? How does a healthy body that's already you know in in good shape? I kind of talk about the immune system's on idle. Um, how are things? How do, how does it work in, when everything goes normal and you may not even realize you had a virus? What what's that look like in terms of how did, how did that get processed? Yeah, that's a great question. That, um, which is really relevant for COVID nineteen. That question in particular, because um, the problem that this virus is different than a lot of the other viruses. That there's an obvious problem with innate immunity is that um, viruses and cells and, and the organisms they infect is like a war. And one of the things that this um, virus seems to um, be able to invade is your innate immunity. Um, it doesn't seem to, to get your immune system's attention early on. It seems to be able to evade, evade the normal innate immunity um, so innate immunity is the first line of defense. And um, you can think of, of that as, you know, like, is your skin intact? Um, are you producing a lot of mucus? Is your cilia beating um, to move the mucus backwards? So in the case of a respiratory virus, those virus particles are coming in through your nose. Um, people don't, and I haven't even heard people talking about this either, is that there's mucus being secreted by all those cells that are lining your, your trachea up through your nose. And there's a long cilia that um, move in a beating fashion so that your mucus is always move, moving um, uh, proximal to distal, so towards the, the nose. And so there's a sheet of sticky material moving backwards in a very healthy um, nose and trachea. And so that would be a form of, of innate immunity. It's just a barrier, the first barrier. Um, there's also things like lysozyme. There's you know uh, a whole bunch of secreted factors that are known to, to block both bacteria, some, some of them viruses. And so if it gets through the barriers and then gets to the actual cell and infects the cell, um, a really cool thing that happens that, um, again, is another thing that people could spend their entire um, life studying is, is when the virus gets into a cell and then it starts replicating its DNA, it also has to make proteins in order to, to do some of its specific function. Well, the amazing thing that every cell in your body has the ability to do is take um, and break up little pieces of that viral protein and attach it to a, a protein um, called uh, an MHC. That's kind of like a whole talk that we could talk about, but they then present those little pieces of the virus, viral particle onto the surface of the cell for surveillance. 
And um, your body knows self from non-self. And when it runs into a little presented piece of protein that it doesn't recognize as self when it's presented next to an MHC molecule, um, it says, oh, invader. And there's a whole slew of things that can happen from that, from cytotoxic T lymphocytes, um, uh, macrophage in, engulfing you know, granulocytes, neutrophils. Um, so there's a lot of things that can happen um, locally. Uh, one of the things I like to share with people they don't know, um, most people don't know, is that you know, those uh, neutrophils will actually make bleach. Um, sodium hypochlorite and will secrete it and kill the cell if it's um, so inclined. Um, so, um, and then same with hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a, a known thing that cells use to, to kill an invader. So all those steps are all sort of innate immunity. And then um, smart viruses have um, usually a way of evading that. Um, each one has a different different way of evading that. Interesting one that I am running into right now is I think uh, uh, might be interesting. I, it's just a hypothesis, but I think uh, it might be sequestering zinc. Everything in viruses, we generally talk about armies and different, because we all understand enough about that. So you could think about um, the, the, there's, there's some attack and in a normal system, um, you have some defense mechanism that contains it squelches it and either kills it, sends it away, um, and it didn't really impact the day-to-day -day operation of the body, right? You kind of had a, a, um, a, a, an uncoordinated, unsophisticated attack. And then it sounds like if I look at something like a, uh, like a COVID-19, think about that maybe more like a SEAL team that went in that, that kind of came in undercover, found its way in, and found some vulnerable spots to uh, to, to to make inroads, and by the time it became evident, now there's a much bigger problem. Doesn't mean you can't put it down, but it's uh, it's obviously a, a a more complex problem because it's got through those first lines of defense. That kind of that's a great analogy. So if I take that, because you raised it up, that was perfect. Because the next place I wanted to take you was into barrier, right? So if we think about the virus, is generally you know you have whatever is the bad stuff on the outside of the world, and if and if this is, you know, the body on this side of the world, it always starts with that barrier, right? So, so maybe just high level, what are the key barriers that protect us from the outside world? Yeah, um, I like the analogy of, of um, the outside world versus inside world, because your sort of your immune system is the inside world and outside is outside where there's toxins and all sorts of things that you don't want getting in. And so skin would be one, um, healthy skin would be a, a barrier. Um, the other most obvious one is um, from your mouth to your tail, your elementary canal. Um, and interestingly, that, that whole um, surface, at least the second half of that whole surface is, is um, has this thing called a brush border on it that dramatically increases the surface area of that tube that goes through you. And um, people don't realize how much surface area that there is there. And it's, um, if I remember correctly, I think it's two tennis courts um, worth of area that are in your uh, small intestines. And so there's a lot of access to your insides from the outside through that. and so. Uh, the first barrier I often think about is is the lining of the intestine, and so keeping that barrier intact is is really important. And that whole system has a whole um, a whole uh, level of complexity to it that is you know is its own thing. But uh, I, I have a diagram that is is a good example of that, and. Uh, in that case, there's there are um, tight junctions that connect cell to cell along those those, and uh, what's really important is for them to um, it's a liquid tight um, connection, a suture, and if uh, 
uh, people probably know the term leaky gut. And so leaky gut is a, uh, is, uh, uh, comes from alternative medicine, um, but in the, in the um, general medicine world, uh, you have a thing called a, a differential sugar test where you have a person take um, uh, two different sugars, a large sugar and a small sugar, uh, consume it, and then measure how quickly it makes it to your um, urine. And that's a, a measure of how big the openings of your intestine uh, are naturally. And having those, those junctions open is a bad thing. And um, look into the literature, it's sort of associated with just about every um, chronic disease process, as well as um, the microbiome, uh, the, the bacteria that line that intestine. Between those two, um, keeping a barrier and keeping the bacteria that are on supposed to be on one side of the barrier intact is, is a very important component to just health in general. If we think about the skin as our first barrier, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, should we be washing our, today, should we be washing our hands with isopropyl alcohol uh, 20 times a day? <laughs> There's a really great story about that because um, I started out in HIV research and um, I, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but the only person who got HIV who was a lab person um, did exactly what you were talking about was they were worried about getting HIV and he was working on HIV. So he was washing his hands um, 20 times a day and also spraying ethanol on his hands over and over again, and um, his skin cracked um, so badly that uh, he actually contracted HIV from his, from his daily work collecting samples. So uh, that barrier is, is uh, an important one to keep intact. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody getting COVID that way, but uh, if you keep doing it, you will. So the problem with doing that is you have the microbiome on your skin. So your first line of defense is, is the microbiome. There's a physical barrier of your skin, which provides that, but also the microbiome is also part of within your skin. And so all you're doing is trying to kill that first line of defense in terms of potentially exposing it and killing all of those soldiers that would be on your front line. Is that kind of fair to say? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I look at it, you can, as advice I give to people is, you think of it as a barrier if you're going into the store. You might want to do it before you go into the store so you're not carrying it in with you. And perhaps when you come out of the store because you've been in a public space, but you know, continuing to do it uh, you know, multiple times in your kitchen when you're cooking and all those things, you're, you're probably just elevating your risk, not, uh, not making it worse. But uh, I, I understand people think it's helpful, but it's the old too much of a good thing. right? So. Um, so the most, most important one is hand awareness when you're in the lab and you're working with, you know, you know I work with viruses that are human infectious. You just, you have, you have to be aware of where your hands are. And you know, everyone has that image of a, a surgeon who walks around with his hands in front of his face like that. And that's, that's so that they remember to pay attention to where their hands are going. Right. Um, don't touch any doorknobs or anything. Um, oh, or imagine you've had your fingers in some hot chili pepper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you've ever you done that, yourself. you wiped your eyes. Yeah, I've done, yeah. done that a couple of times and didn't need to be reminded again. Um, so we kind of bring it back to, um, so this is our first line of defense is the barrier, kind of protecting the skin and um, and our our gut system, which is from, from our mouth to our rectum. Um, and so behind that, you mentioned earlier, so this is the outside world is coming at us on the outside. We actually have far more surface area inside with all of the surface area in our, um, uh, the way I guess our, our epithelial cells are within our intestines in particular, uh, far more surface area there. Immediately behind that, only one cell deep is what protects us from the outside world. So everything we drink, everything we breathe, um, 
So there's not much there. Tremendous surface area, which means high exposure risk. We put it in uh, in a risk perspective. Um, and it's right behind that, which is where your first line of defense is now in terms of within your virus uh, army um, that sits there, right? So, so if we are... Um, if we have leaky guts, what's happening to our immune system? Yeah, the general um, way to think about uh, that is that right on the other side of that um, that layer of cells is um, it's called the GALT or gut associated lymphoid tissue is a lot of immune surveillance happens right there because um, you have to, it's just a place where you're surveilling the uh, um, the outside world. So if you have leaky gut, you're getting um, proteins, uh, especially in a compromised um, intestine where the food is not broken down the whole way to amino acids and the uh, carbohydrates are not you know broken down to simple sugars. You're getting things uh, introduced to your immune system that has shape to it. And those shapes are what your immune system is trying to figure out is foreign or not. Uh, and you can see how if you, you have too many things thrown at that immune system at the same time, that you're making antibodies and um, fighting things that aren't really invaders. And uh, that whole system of of uh, like I was talking before of seeing what is self and what is not self is one of the most important components of the immune system is it moves, moves around and surveils every cell in your whole body and says, are you self? Are you self? Are you self? One at a time. And if it's no, it kills it. So if you have a confused immune system, it's uh, also another really important feature of chronic disease is that um, you don't want your own immune system fighting your own organs. Um, in virtually every disease state, there's some component, or at least a lot of the famous diseases that we know about, um, there's an autoimmune component to it where you're sending in immune cells to a, um, say, into your kidney, um, and saying that that's foreign and you're getting immune cells going in there and doing that same thing we were talking about earlier is um, releasing hydrogen peroxide and, and bleach into your kidney. And you can imagine that that has some dire consequences to it. So um, almost every chronic disease state has a component of immune and inappropriate immune infiltration. And so because of that, um, we're back to the integrity of that, of that lining of uh, the small intestine as being a really central feature of, of uh, making sure your immune system knows what is self and what is non-self, so it can fight it appropriately. And, and, and those are what we characterize as autoimmune response, right? And we, and we call them autoimmune diseases. So, so just to kind of summarize, it's a once you have a breakdown in that primary barrier being leaky gut, um, uh, I describe it as a state of chaos that starts to happen and just degree of what level of chaos. And so it shouldn't be surprising now that the body's having a hard time keeping up. It, it can't just keep pro producing more and more immune system. You've got caps on everything, right? right. So, so the, more, the more burden you put on it, the more likely it's going to start to make mistakes. So, so one of the easiest, one of the easiest ways to protect ourselves is to protect that uh, that immune system by by not ex not overexposing it or overtaxing it. And I think that's what you know. As I describe to people around when we talk about the standard American diet, if we reduce it right down, um, that's really what we're doing. Is as a result of of those choices, we're overloading our immune system. We don't have a visual response or a physiological response that's acute typically to respond to, but um, that's that slow chronic uh, uh, activity that's happening quietly. Uh, immune system's trying hard, but it just 
know, it's, it's, it, there's this l- losing battle going on that, that we're not even aware of until it becomes some level that, that we can detect, right? So, so we think about kind of that, that immune system. There's a commander in chief uh, of, the, of the immune system, uh, which you mentioned earlier, so I'll, I'll bring it back. So, so, so there's this orchestra playing. Um, again, think about that. And, and, and the conductor of the orchestra is NRF2. Right. So so maybe talk a little bit about um, kind of what happens with NRF2 in association with aging, in association with disease and things, and um, just kind of get us grounded on that. And we'll drill into that a little bit more. Yeah. So uh, um, again, here, uh, a, uh, uh, a slide uh, would be useful in, in getting the, the general picture of NRF2. Um, the way NRF2 works is it's a sensor basically for um, toxins. And so if you have a, um, a toxin that um, affects uh, this basically um, reactive cysteines um, or reducing um, uh, agents, the uh, what happens is there's a um, a protein complex in your cytoplasm that's waiting there sensing uh, toxins. And so NRF2 is one of the proteins and the other protein is called KEAP1, K-E-A-P-1. And um, when they're together, the system is off and that whole protein complex is degraded um, by the proteasome. So it's um, ubiquinated and then degraded. And so that system is kept very low um, if, you're, if you don't have uh, toxins in your body. Um, there's not a need to, to ramp up any kind of uh, um, amount of response to a toxin. So interestingly, um, that's not the case for us living in this world right now, is that there's lots and lots of toxins. And it turns out, I think, the important ones are ones that get past the system. And um, so say a virus, a virus that's able to bypass um, a lot of those innate immunity uh, things, then it gets into a cell. Um, a lot of viruses actually turn off NRF2. And it's a way that you can bypass an important, um, an important defense system. And, uh, but a lot of the foods that we eat um, and molecules that we deem as important nutrients turn on NRF2. And so a molecule that can bind and um, release NRF2 from that keep one and keep it from being degraded, the NRF2 will increase in abundance. And then um, by by bypassing that degradation machinery. And then that NRF2 will translocate into the nucleus and it acts like a transcription factor and it turns on a whole bunch of genes. Um, I've heard 300 genes, I've heard 3000 genes, um, but it's a large number of genes. And they're in a bunch of different categories. Um, the the um, Probably the most well studied um, component of of it is in detoxification because a toxin turns on this pathway, it turns on detoxification. So that would be the entire um, glutathione system, but there's a whole bunch of genes that are involved in in detoxification. And it's again, a whole orchestra. And there's a large number of genes a good way to think about it is um, this toxin gets into a cell. Um, first, one of the first things you have to do is bind to the toxin, and then you're going to do some kind of shuttling it out of your system. Um, so you inactivate it, you bind um, glutathione to it, and then you have a glutathione transferase where you get it transferred out of the out of the cell. That complex gets carried through your 
bloodstream and then goes to either your kidney or your small intestines to be released, um, um, to gotten rid of. So that's kind of classic phase one, phase two, phase three uh, detoxification that happens. And so um, NRF2 is, an, uh, is a commander in, in chief, using your analogy, who turns, mobilizes the army to get rid of those toxins. And so that's one of the big ones. And then an, another area is in um, reactive oxygen species. People know a lot about uh, um, the fact that there's reactive oxygen species in your, being produced inside every one of your cells and that um, they cause damage. And if you have higher ROS production in any cell, there's damage of everything, lipid, protein, nucleic acid um, in a cell. And you want to, if you have a toxin, again, uh, introduced to that cell, you want to block um, that excess reactive oxygen species production in, in that cell if you're um, going to try and protect against that toxin. So it turns on all the battery of genes that are that are um, reactive oxygen species. So uh, a lot of people know about antioxidants that a single molecule binds to a, uh, an oxidant and inactivates it. Um, but what we're talking about here are enzyme systems. So you know, if you turn on thirty different enzymes, each one of those enzymes catalyzes that um, removal of an oxidant. And it does it over and over and over and over again. And then that enzyme is uh, stays around for hours or days. So really the way to get rid of or tamp down reactive oxygen species is, is through enzymatic pathways. So that probably is a good place to, to cut off. <laughs> I could keep going with yeah. that that subject matter, but um okay. and I like to tie it into to um, chromatin structure too, which is part of my PhD, but I know we're you know, okay. precipitous and close to the edge of the cliff there. Um, so just uh, as I thought a, a question uh, as you went through that, uh, do we have any way of measuring practically uh, those of us on this side of the lab, uh, NRF2 uh, or activity of uh, uh, reactive oxygen species? Uh, in our bodies, is that something that's easily done? Or yeah, there's there's measures that are um, um, measures of that. You can have um, um, blood samples sent off to get um, uh, sed rate is a measure of inflammation, which is associated with that. Um, uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, is a, is a measure of that. Eight uh, oxy guanidine. There's, there are um, measures of uh, DNA, um, basically DNA damage, things like that. Um, Anything that's where we have reduced NRF2 levels is going to reduce my body's ability to cope with those toxins that are coming in trace elements in food, you know, whether it's in the water and different things that I drink. So it's really protection against the things that I can't see. Right. So, um, and I think that's what kind of we're getting at today is is accepting yes the world has far more toxins in it for all sorts of reasons and we can go around and put a bunch of band-aids on all those uh places if we if we tried but ultimately um the better we keep our barrier intact and the better we keep our our nf2 levels up we're our bodies are going to be able to naturally process that uh, uh on a daily basis with uh, far lower risks that seem fair to say yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have some data um, with probably the most pervasive uh, pesticide out there, glyphosate, um, in uh, liver cells, showing that uh, glyphosate at, at levels that are actually um, can be achieved through eating what we call a dirty meal um, would for sure. Um, lower NRF2 levels and we showed that. And um, so that was an interesting finding that that 
just a common pesticide is is lowering the ability to to uh, defend yourself. Yeah, and then in the and then the case of when you look at um, things that uh, boost NRF two, it would be in a you know a small group of uh, natural compounds that boost it would. Most people have associated with health um, also boost NRF2. So. Right, yeah. Okay, so um, so I'll, let's, I want to come back to that in a minute. The other point I just want to touch on here before we leave genetics. Um, so you've talked uh, about epigenetics and kind of the, the 20,000 or so genes that we have. Um, so most people still grew up with the belief of of longevity is generally associated with genetics. You and I haven't uh, had this conversation previously, but I, I, I'm I'm pretty confident that uh, that I know where it's going to land. Um, so so in terms of what's going to influence our long term health, um, is it our genes or our epigenetics? Which are then which ones can we? You know, the, our genes are fixed; they are what we inherited, but um, what, what, what's your view on that, given given your uh, long history around uh, uh, in in the world of genetics? Yeah, so it's um, I I always say uh, my PhD advisor um, was way ahead of way ahead of the the, the curve um, in that and he was in the seventies um, studying epigenetics, so. Um, uh, he or his lab that he was working in, this is Dr. Sharon at Johns Hopkins, um, uh, coined the term transdetermination. And that's where one cell type actually turns into another cell type during development. And that is epigenetic. So um, my short spiel on epigenetics, I always uh, talk about development and then in the context of aging. So in the area of development, um, say you're one, one cell in, in an egg, um, that egg is uh, reproduced so that you have you know, thousands or tens of thousands of cells. Um, and those, each of those cells kind of looks the same. Um, they aren't determined yet. They aren't uh, differentiated. And then that's what development is, is that if you're a single cell in there, you have to figure out who you are. And by a series of um, determining anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, time, induction events, all kinds of things that uh, the developmental biologist lives in, uh, at the end of that, that uh, cell has to remember who he is for the rest of his life. So in, in our case, that cell has to remember for 80 years. And so that's the context for aging that I always start from, is that the act of aging is forgetting who you're supposed to be. And so that's what cancer is, that's what um, aging is. And so what are the precipitating factors that make a cell forget who it is. And so using the reactive oxygen species analogy, um, anytime you distract the machinery that is necessary for remembering who you are, you age. And so um, there's a number of molecules that do double duty. They monitor DNA strand breaks and they maintain the transcriptional memory of all your genes. The more times you distract that um, set of genes that are there to maintain the transcriptional memory of your cell, the faster you're going to age. And so um, that's how I, I see aging. And um, uh, I put, usually put that together with uh, any kind of disease model is you always have precipitating events before you have a disease of aging. 
whatever that might be, emotional, uh, trauma, stress, reactive oxygen species, you know, an accident, a viral infection, anything is a precipitating event. And your genetics will determine what disease you get. So you sleep deprive somebody and make them breathe, you know, a known carcinogen uh, and put them in a room. Eventually you'll fall off the cliff and find out what disease state you're predetermined to have. Um, but we want to keep you from the edge of that cliff and then do all the things that push your epigenetics back to remembering your genes and repair the damage that happens from, from um, everyday insults. So I usually combine the epigenetic um, memory with energy, energy metabolism. So when I think about pathways, you have to have the energy to repair. And that's uh, kind of like a, a one, two, one, two punch. You um, do the things that, that um, push aging backwards towards younger. And you also um, block um, inflammation and you provide the energy so a cell can maintain all of its uh, normal functions of refolding proteins, repairing, um, uh, correcting DNA strand breaks, and all of that. So it sounds like from everything you said, um, we have significant influence over our aging trajectory. Yeah. Tons. Yeah. So, so that's the, um, that, that's the simple way, <laughs> um, and, and understanding and, and that's the good thing is we don't need to understand, but we do need to know what are the things to do in terms of lifestyle choices. Um, and I think it leads beautifully into, um, a few of the areas where, where you've, uh, been, been doing some work is, is around some of the supplement areas with obviously with, uh, some of the can cancer patients you've been working with. Um, so maybe we can talk about those uh, a little bit. And in general, when we think about supplements, um, I, I think you would refer to them as nutraceuticals, right? They're naturally occurring materials that we're, that, that we're talking about here as opposed to pharmaceuticals. Is that right? right? Okay. Yeah, natural compounds. So okay. pharmaceuticals have to be a unique molecule, a unique structure. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, so one of them... Um, one of them I was thinking about was, and that's really how I first uh, first discovered you a couple of years ago, and I was stalking you, and and you didn't know it, because <laughs> I read. Uh, I'm always I'm always interested in reading scientific journals and things. So, so one of them was around the uh, the leaky gut work that uh, that you had done. Um, so that was looking at at um, at at the uh, at the tight junctions, and that was work I think you were doing with uh, Dr. Zach Bush, and it came out of eventually they put it out as a product called Restore, which is now uh, I think Ion Gut Health. Um, so, so tell me, kind of, so at the at at that cellular level, what, what, what's going on there that uh, from a leaky gut, like what, what what changes as a result of that particular supplement? Um, in terms of why should I care about uh, what it's doing? Yeah. Um, I, I talk to a lot of people about that um, supplement and uh, sort of over the years, I've, I, I think I've landed on a, an approach that doesn't um, uh, scare people away from it, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't put it into the uh, snake oil category, as you say it. And uh, because the, the, the supplement is, is a very unique supplement um, and it's kind of mysterious and that's because um, it as a product um, is proprietary. And so you can't too, talk too much about the actual constituents of it without um, you know, giving away any trade secrets and things. But one thing that you you can talk about 
or at least that I, I do talk about is that um, as an introduction to it is uh, if you have a gigantic garden and you were to compost all of your food and grow all of your own vegetables in your backyard or greenhouse, however you plan to do that, um, it's my personal belief that you would have um, little need for restore. But because I don't think most people compost 100% of their um, fruits and vegetables, that there is a, um, in our food production system, there's a major gap. There's a giant gap. And um, I mean, the best way to fill that gap is to, to get as much food as you can um, from a farmer who uh, does composting. And, uh, but the, uh, a great stopgap for that would be to take uh, substances from a gigantic composting experiment that happened 20 million years ago. And that is the uh, composting of the entire earth when uh, the earth was in balance. And so uh, that composted earth from a balanced forest that happened over millions of years is um, is what is I, I think of is what product restore is, and so uh, that that product um, its primary um, uh, place where I've studied has an amazing ability to tighten tight junctions, and I personally think that that is. Um, this sort of miracle of it is that tightening that barrier is something that I think would help just about everybody. And it does have that ability and kind of miraculously so. Given the cancer work you do and some other things, that obviously caught your attention. Yeah. And so so what what was it that caught your attention? Because it would, it would, I would expect to be a distraction for the type of work that you're doing. So Yeah, that, you're right. That, that. It is neat. Um, so because I meet with um, people about um, cancer all the time, uh, they have all different stages of cancer. And um, I always feel like my job is to, to just talk about all the factors that are involved in, in cancer. And... Um, uh, when someone's done their um, chemo and radiation, you know, uh, there's a nice time frame there for uh, between the end of that and the next five years when you're actually fighting your cancer, um, that there are things that you can do. So someone brought me um, a bottle of, of Restore and said, um, what is this? And uh, what could it be doing? You know, like, why um, would my uh, doctor um, hand this to me and say it, 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 it's good for health? And uh, that was the doctor was Zach Bush. He had um, discovered this this uh, nutrient, this this product, and uh, and so I was very interested in it. I had. Um, a lot of things, uh, systems up and going, and I knew that this came from uh, a source that had had to do with um, communication between the roots of of uh, of plants and soil, and that looks surprisingly similar to villus in your intestines and root hairs that are on roots. And because there's a microbiome just outside of roots that are necessary for health, and there's a microbiome outside of, uh, outside of your small intestine that's imperative for health, that I thought the, the best place to study how it might function was, in, was at that barrier. And, it sort of really just fell out. Uh, as soon as you put it on, those cells, the cells look different. And 
when cells look different, it usually has to do with cell location. That's that's how I went down that pathway. We're interested in how do we separate the 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 genuine from all of the other stuff coming out of people's garage that uh, that might work or not, but it just hasn't gone under the rigor. And maybe that would be the other. Uh, if it's not yeah, obvious maybe. here, right? I assume yeah. when you look at something, and not that you have evaluated all the supplements out there in the market, but they would not be subjected to the kind of rigor of of what you would do with your labs there. I I just I I I can't imagine it's anything like what you do there. Yeah, the um, in fact, um, for that supplement, we did a large amount of work on on that supplement and actually put in two R01s to the NIH um, for that. And um, I think it was a little bit uh, too different. Um, uh, we didn't get that funding, but we do have all that information from doing those thorough, um, accurate tests. And we did uh, put glyphosate on cells and show uh, plate junction disruption we did put um, um, type one uh, casein on cells for the milk proteins um, and disrupted plate junctions. And we put um, gluten on okay. cells and showed type junction disruption and showed that restore blocks all three of those. Yeah, so those are, those are three big ones people wrestle with uh, commonly, right? Right. right. Um, so the other one I wanted to talk about with you was. Um, one that's been around since uh, I think it's about 1992 with Johns, Johns Hopkins was uh, looking at it then that they described as the ultimate in cancer fighting benefits, uh, that being sulforaphane um, and goes back to, you know, why President Bush needed to eat more broccoli. And <laughs> um, so people are, you know, that, that's the one that's associated with broccoli in particular, um, just as the introduction. From the work that you've done now in your research, how much broccoli would we need to eat on any given day to kind of get the levels of sephorophane? And we'll talk about what the benefits are, but just to kind of put it in context, like, you know, in the swimming pool kind of analogy of, of sizes and things. Um, and, and I heard a, a number of pounds of broccoli a day. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. So um, I often talk about therapeutic dose, and that's super important in the lab because you have to get the... The actual molecule in in contact with the cell you're trying to to affect, and so in the case of um, broccoli, uh, in order to get the therapeutic dose, the lowest therapeutic dose that um, functions in terms of sulforaphane is to get um, uh, ten milligrams, is five or ten milligrams is is uh, generally accepted where you start moving the needle. And uh, it would be seven pounds of broccoli in order to get um, that. So I don't know if uh, there's you'd a, have to really love broccoli. <laughs> Why is sulforaphane so powerful? What what is it? What is it doing? Kind of at that highest level that uh, that caused uh, uh, the researchers at Johns Hopkins to pay attention and make that statement uh, so many years ago now. Yeah, so I think the um, the breakthrough was um, them finding out that uh, that uh, broccoli sprouts had a, l a large amount of sulforaphane relative, and so in the case of um, broccoli sprouts, I think four ounces, which is a little bit easier to to consume, um, would be adequate for uh, uh, getting that same that same uh, ten milligrams. So that's kind of when it started uh, in popularity is when it became possible to, to uh, get a therapeutic dose by eating broccoli sprouts. And um, so there's a large number of studies we can talk about, but basically the, the, the bottom line is what's the amount that activates NRF2 okay. and so forth is the best and natural inducer of, of NRF2, but obviously pharmacy Pharmaceutical companies are going after it um, using non-natural compounds, but uh, in terms of natural compounds, sulforaphane is the best inducer. So in terms of just the stuff that any of us can do, 
he said earlier around the importance of NRF2, nothing matches sulforaphane, right? And the uh, and, I, and I think you, you can certainly do the the sprouts, and I think um, you know, you've, you've supported with helping people who want to do it on their own. The practical challenge is, I think, with uh, as my recollection with sprouts is there's a really tight window, right, where the sulforaphane levels kind of start out and then they spike. And and how tight is that window? Yeah, like in the three day um, period, optimum is you know in between three and fourth day. <clears throat> right. So so and then it does go down. So you so, have to constantly have a uh, a system going in order to take so forth in every day. That that was where I got to is I, I would have to have seven of these sprout jars going and make enough for each day for if I was going to get the benefit or eat a lot more. Um, yeah. So again, the, the practical side of it, it's certainly doable. Um, and for a someone who loves to garden, that's uh, that's probably probably very achievable. Uh, just yeah. just wasn't uh, wasn't in my my daily routine. So so we see lots of sulforaphane out there. It's, again, as soon as a name becomes popular, everyone tries to take advantage of the name. Um, the work you have done around this is seems to be different, and it's because it's stabilized. So. Why is that so important? And I assume that separates it from all of the other uh, stuff that come out of different people's uh, garages and places. Right. Yeah. The um, the molecule sulforaphane is not stable, and that has been you know in written in so many different papers. And uh, but what is what is stable is the precursor molecule called glucoraphanin, and um, it's a great great molecule and uh, um, there's been supplements that that have that have that precursor molecule out for a long time um, and I don't want to you know boohoo those those supplements but um, I think a disservice that happened from those supplements was that um, somewhere in the middle there they uh, coined a name called um, sulforaphane glucosinolate um, and so people thought that it was sulforaphane um, but it isn't it's the it's still the precursor and so there really wasn't a supplement out there and that was why I got involved was I wanted it to the people that I was trying to help and um, there was a particular person who was had a really aggressive form of breast cancer and I already knew that uh, sulforaphane uh, worked really well on breast cancer because I put it on cells and it showed levels it needed to kill it. And this particular cell type was a cancer stem, uh, cancer stem cell, very difficult to kill. And so I needed, knew I needed to, this molecule to get it to this person. And so then I started the study of how how to how to uh, stabilize it. Because I knew of the type of research that you were doing, we came across at Broccoli, uh, and I mentioned before um, around kind of, uh, I've had a brother dealing with cancer, quite serious cancer for a number of years. And so um, so there's really only been two products that in terms of supplements that I've been able to recommend to him. And oddly enough, they both come from you <laughs> uh, in terms of from your work. Uh, and that was the other, and um, you know, his his uh, his experience has been, um, you know, it has been really amazing to see. I, again, we, we don't know how much any of these things help, right? There's no no way of saying it's because of this, this, and this. But it's uh, it's uh, you know, I, I know he shouldn't be with us today, um, and he shouldn't have been as active for as many years as he has been, but. Um, but anyway, so 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 broccoli uh, is is the company, and I'll I'll, I'll post uh, any of this stuff in the bottom. Um, and, and what's truly unique about it is that it's stabilized. Um, so it's part of our again, it's part of our routine here. Uh, what we take uh, in our home purely for proactive reasons. The um, again, and it goes back to if for no other reason, just. Yeah, everything we can do to boost NRF2, even though you know we eat clean, we eat organic, um, you know, that doesn't mean the food comes clean given given the environment that we're in. So um, 
yeah it, and it's it's easy for us so that's the uh, so so this would be for me saying you know my opportunity to say thank you um because that's where a lot of these ideas come from right people people know something and they see an opportunity and they want to help and that's clearly what what you've you've done here um in your in your humble approach to uh, to trying to help people uh, uh get back to health so 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 thank you for that it, you probably have some data that uh that uh, you may want to be able to share with us that uh, just to kind of show, because, because you're a data guy as, a, as am I, you just happen to be in the lab these days and I'm, uh, I'm stuck here, but uh, mm-hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what your testing has shown to kind of back it up as opposed to the anecdotal stories or. Yeah. I, um, I was really interested in, in, you know, proving that it worked, um, that the molecule is actually getting to the cell level. Like I've mentioned a bunch of times and that's a, that's a central tenet I have for um, recommending a supplement and how much you take. Um, so I was really interested in, in making sure it worked at the cell level and came up with an experiment where I actually think it's the first time that um, it's been shown that NRF2 is activated in a person uh, at the cellular level. Um, and so I have a I have a a uh, set of images that I think are really interesting. In that uh, uh, I do a lot of work right now on the kidney, and so it's kind of where the idea came from. Was I look at shed cells in urine to measure um, physiology, cell physiology in people that have hypertension. <clears throat> So I thought another um, uh, cell that we have, live cell that we have access to is actually the, the lining of uh, your mouth, the buccal cells or buccal cells. I'm not sure how you say it. <laughs> I only read about it. So um, these cells are, are lining um, your mouth. It's a squamous epithelial cells. And um, you have easy access to it. You can just take a, take a uh, cotton swab and you can put it on a glass slide and voila, you have cells there. And um, I uh, have a really nice microscope and the ability to stain for NRF2 um, quickly and easily. And basically what I did was I took those cells and incubated them with the super expensive sulforaphane that you get from Sigma. It's like five milligrams is six hundred dollars something like that and then i took uh uh our pill uh and you know diluted it appropriately uh down to uh, the therapeutic level um which uh i thought was around uh five micromole and then the next thing i did was i just took two pills of broccoli and then waited two hours and and then took those buccal swabs, uh, buccal cells again and stained for NF2 and basically showed that that uh, the amount of broccoli that gets to those cells is equivalent to five micromole of the expensive sulforaphane when you just incubate with them for the same two hours. And so I have the immunofluorescent um, evidence for that. And uh, so I think you can pretty much be sure that uh, um, you'll get a therapeutic dose of sulforaphane if you take uh, the, the typical two doses of that. I wanted that not to sell it. I wanted it for the people I was sitting down with that you know, as a foundation for, for whatever food that they eat, eating cleaner, um, fighting you know, the carcinogens that are sneaking through, and uh, that was a that was a big moment for me that I actually uh, found out that the normal dose that we're suggesting to do was actually at a high enough dose to really do something. Yeah, and that that, that you know, as a as a science guy, that those are the things that that mean a lot to to me. Um, you know, the anecdotal stories are emotional and and for a lot of us, that's really all we have to look to. But um, uh, it, 
to be able to put the science behind it is is to me it's really important. So so we know that there's a number of now or at least a a few um, supplements out there that have really gone through a lot of rigor, and obviously this this is probably almost the level of scrutiny you put into what you're choosing for yourself and probably for your family. So if I can ask you and put you in a position to say, well, what what does what does Dr. Gilday do in practice uh, w- w- when he goes home? Um, you know that that, that I might want to pay attention to and, and replicate. That's great. That's great because uh, I don't get asked that question very often. So it's maybe my first time answering that. Well, I got um, inside your lab, and now we'll get inside your kitchens. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I would say that. Over the last 18 years, we did a very slow change of everything. And so what it looks like um, now is um, we juice every morning. So we we uh, do a, a conglomeration of 10 different vegetables and fruits and do Drink fresh juice every morning. That's one of the things that uh, basically very early on was convinced that there's a lot of compounds and vegetables that uh, are very strong uh, pro-health molecules. And a lot of them work synergistically where they, they work together. So it's a good way to get a whole bevy of them. And uh, probably should talk about which, which vegetables. Is it appropriate to talk about which ones I juice? Absolutely. I don't, I don't think anybody has the corner on which are the proprietary vegetables. So uh, Okay, good. Yeah. So um, I always do kale. We do cilantro, parsley. Um, we do uh, a carrot and an apple for taste. Um, there's some good things in there too, but... Um, and then we do uh, bok choy. And um, what else? Bok choy, celery, um, red beetroot uh, with the greens. And I'm not sure what I'm missing. <laughs> that might be all of them. Well, that, that, that's. And a tomato, sorry. Okay. So all those are available and. And I assume you probably give the same advice that I do. If you can buy it or, well, if you can get it out of your garden, that's the first place. Buy organic, that's the next choice. If you can't get organic, you're still better to get conventional yep. than, than not at all. Right? Yeah, so that um, we think of a, as a, uh, a supplement. The, um, um, we're part of a CSA, so we get all our vegetables from CSA or, or organic when that's not available in the winter. And then um, we, uh, with friends, raise our own um, cow. So the small amount of meat that we do eat um, is grass-fed. And the chickens that we do eat are you know, real free-range. Uh, the eggs that we eat are real uh, free-range eggs. And of course, you know, the, the correct proportions of that is important. So. Um, uh, we say we're vegetarians, except we eat a little bit of super high grade, um, uh, those, those three things as well. Can you tell us kind of how often would meat, uh, meat and eggs be part of your diet? Is that a daily, weekly? So eggs and meat both would be, um, uh, a few times a week. Okay. Um, we also eat fish a few times a week. Okay. Um, so in the case of, uh, besides the, that uh, timing is really important for us. So we only eat two meals a day um, with six hours in between. So we're on an 18, 18 hour intermittent fasting schedule. Uh, don't ever eat outside of that window. Um, the other thing that we do is, uh, uh, I take uh, in the morning some caprylic acid, uh, C8, uh, medium chain triglyceride, um, 
to try and boost those um, butyrate levels um, for those you know six or six or so hours before lunch. And then um, uh, we have a bevy of, of supplements. And at current time, I think I'm making almost all of my supplements because uh, I found you know problems with with virtually all of them. And so I'm in the process of uh, I have 10 or 10 or 12 supplements that I make myself and are in differing stages of completeness. Well, that, that's uh, that we should probably wrap it up there just b- before people uh, have totally uh, gone asleep as, as you and I can. I know go on all day uh, with this stuff, so, but uh, I'm sure we'll 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 be talking again and we'll drill into some uh, some specific areas a little bit deeper. But um, but uh, John, th- thank you, thank you for bringing us into your world. Um, yeah, I, I'm just constantly reminded this is this is a rare treat. Uh, uh, to be able to to get in and uh, and and have you share really your your wealth of experience uh, to have access to you without, without any um, tr- trying to sell anything or trying to you know there's no marketing no politics this is truly at the science level and we just in the in the outside world uh, don't get a look in there so it's a it, it's a real treat for us and I, I, I want to thank you for for being part of the longevity advantage community and, and trying to help us uh, to help our community. And obviously you're doing a lot of work for your, your community there in Charlottesville. Uh, it's exciting. You know, it's exciting because it, what I hear in this is there's, there's reason for hope, right? There, there are more things that we can do that we, we don't realize. And so part of what, uh, part of my mission is to how do we get that in front of people and uh, you know, without credible resources to go to, that you know, uh, that, that I, I can't do my job. So, so thank you, thank you very much for taking us down this that, that down this path so eloquently and uh, and explaining it at, at plenty of depth. I think for most of us, I'm sure there'll be a few who want more, but we'll have more for them another day, hopefully. Thank you very much.